So I'm going to ask each of you, just in one minute, to make an observation on one of the other panelists' presentations. So a reflection, maybe a connection you can see between your work and one of the other speakers' work, or an idea that you never knew about before that you think is very interesting. And you're the nearest, so I'm going to put you on the spot. So uh, just a sort of reflection on either Rosie or Pavin's, anything that popped into your mind. Um, I, actually, what I really liked was the shoes, to be honest. I thought that was a fantastic, I'd never heard of Tungiasis. I'd never ever heard of it before, um, so it must be a ne neglected disease. Um, uh, but I, th I thought um, I have a friend who works in Kenya who does um, uh, a lot of stuff with a lot of stuff with trachoma. And uh, but I thought that was really interesting. And actually, it's a really simple solution. And it, it is always the simple solutions that that we sort of miss. Mm. We go for these complicated ideas, and actually, it's just basic stuff. Mm. And they're there, there's waste tires, there's tires everywhere in Kenya. Mm. Um, and it's just a really simple way of solving a, a horrible problem. Very good, very good. Well, going from simple to complex, I'm just going to stick Bavin on the spot <laughs> there. I don't know if you either want to respond to that point or just a reflection on one of the other presentators or both. Yeah, so uh, just to mirror that, uh, I agree completely uh, that I think that's a fantastic solution, a fantastic idea. And it is, you can take it to almost any country and then provide that solution. So that was great to see, and the simplicity was brilliant. Um, obviously, there's the synergy between the community uh, toilets and um, what we're doing. Um, I really like the aspect of community engagement for the young and indoctrinating children, so then they will adopt those technologies as they grow up yeah. because they're kind of come through. So yeah, that, that was a really good strategy to get people on board. Yeah. Um, just, I guess one one question, or, or, or sorry, not question. Well, you can have you no. He, you are allowed to answer a question, but you can't answer it straight away. You can pose yeah, yeah. the question. Yeah. Um, I, I understand what you're saying about when the government had asked for scaling up, and you weren't comfortable with the mechanism. It's just a more of a philosophical philosophical question of how do we break that? How do we, you know? Um, Okay, so hold that thought. That's, that's a very important question. Brilliant, Bavin. You, so that's good. That, that, I'm, giving, I'm giving him nine out of ten for that intervention. Very good. You've both done well so far. Rosie, um, something that occurred to you. Um, I was really fascinated by both Rosie, both both, 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 both. Um, I was quite surprised how you also have a waste, a waste separated waste, but how you use it and you get the water back from the end, and that's fantastic innovation. And uh, oh, I, I don't know if it's working, but. Um, I just, Great. Um, John, any sort of overall thoughts, anything that struck you? Upon you? <laughs> well, um, or a comment on one of them. I mean, um, I, I think my comment on on, on general talks, um, firstly, I think the issue that we raised in your talk, the only ability to produce and where will they be produced is critical because to me, the value chain of sanitation solutions big issue. And I was delighted when you approached the challenge of the move from the rural to the urban, because the, the population statistics are that more people will be living in African cities than will be living in rural areas, and it's already past the consent mark. And the, the urban challenge is really big, um, and, and you, know, you obviously jumped into that room. Great stuff. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to open the floor, um, but Hanging in the air is Bavin's very excellent question of if it's hard to work with government, how are we going to solve the problem of going to scale is how I could paraphrase your question. So leaving that hanging in the air is another thought for anybody. Would, has anybody else got any sort of reflections, observations? Yes. As loud as you can, sorry. Sorry, I was pleased to see the presentation about the sanitary towers and see that as one little line in the text. Never hear anything about it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a 
that's a really good question. It is a good question, and you're not allowed to answer it yet. Okay. Hold that thought. Okay. Um, so that's the sort of sit whole systems question. You know, have we have we got? Is your system solving everything? Any, any other sort of reflections or thoughts? Yes. The one thing I'd say is with both the systems, it's very much a one system, one family unit thing. <laughs> um, whereas that means that you've got an awful lot of systems going on, which I, 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 I think means there's a lot of work going into each unit, and, and the scalability should maybe not just be on the yeah, lots of little ones, but, but how can these systems be scaled up? Well, and I think that's particularly interesting, echoing back to John's point, that I think there are, there are economies of population density which change your optimization for sure as you go into urban spaces. Anybody else? Any reflections or thoughts? Paul? What, what sort of uh, Paul, go, you go first. And sorry, I missed you. Um, I sort of promise that, that you think at the end of the day, if you're looking at an urban society, particularly a poor one, what sort of pricing would you be thinking about? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, hold on. No, uh, 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 and, uh, yeah, I actually had another one for the, for the eco, sound eco. You, you didn't, I mean, it's great what you're doing with the communities. You didn't actually say what sort of the toilet you were producing, whether it was a pit latrine or. No, they're all UPTs. Sorry? You're in diverting dry They're toilets. They're all UPTs. Okay. So it's separation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay. Um, there's a question over here of comments, preferably rather than questions. I'm going to reframe your question in a different way in a minute. Sorry, Paul. Uh, lady behind in the blue suit, and then pretty. Mine actually is on the UPTT. Uh, like in my country, I know that uh, that has actually been piloted, uh, especially within the river right areas where the water table is quite high. But uh, the problem most times is actually the cost. Most times, uh, many people find it very difficult because in communities uh, where they are all rural and uh, funding is a problem, then the cost of uh, actually erecting such becomes a very, very big problem. And we're actually looking at how it could actually be cost effective for them to be able to uh, uh, afford uh, these because for places where you have high water table, this is perfect. What what about the cost? Yeah, that's that's true. Although I would just challenge you back in reverse and say, just because something's expensive doesn't mean that you might not decide as a public policy to implement it. I have a pipe sewerage system in my house. I have never paid the cost of that pipe sewerage because that cost, that infrastructure cost, was sunk long ago. So I think we have to actually unpack that cost and price question quite a lot, which I will bring back to you, is why I wouldn't let you answer Paul's question. Uh, Pretty. I think great Ooh. minds think alike, I'm looking at both of you, because my question was going to be not just the cost, but pricing, but who actually bears the burden? Yeah. Uh, is it the private sector, is it the public sector, <laughs> is it uh, people running the schools? So actually, who bears the burden? And actually thinking about how important it is to work with local governments. Yeah. Any other interventions at this point? Over here. You can, you can start answering each other's questions, by the way. That's allowed, too. Um, I just wanted to make a comment um, about, like, if you think that as well, shared sanitation and individual household sanitation. And, yeah, like, it's the first time, actually, it was really interesting to see the nano memory, because I've heard about it. Like, I didn't actually realize it happened. But I tended to hate it, sorry. Just because it sounds so technical <laughs> and, and, and horrible. But it looks amazing. So yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was, yeah, really interesting to follow that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, so, and then obviously the sanitation versus a shared, a shared toilet, and how is that going to kind of look at monitoring everything and weighting everything and sustainable development? Actually, I'd like to applaud your honesty because I was thinking in wash in wash functions, people sit around and say, "Oh, how lovely to see you! How nice! Got your plan is really ridiculous, isn't it?" So you know, that's that's very honest of you. Well done. No, no, he picked it up later. It's not his fault, first. Yeah. So before I take any more, I want to. I, so there's a there's a kind of underlying sort of interesting question here. One is about 
filling all the gaps that need filling, the household gap, the shared gap, the school gap, the, you know, all of the, and then, you know, beyond sanitation question. And then the second piece, which Paul picked up on in the question over here, is, and, and in fact, the first point, which is, can you see, or based on the work you've been doing, do you have any sense of how we should start to imagine sanitation being embedded in institutional systems? You know, we often talk about should it be the private sector, should it be the public sector, but I think there's a much more sophisticated question to ask, which is how do you imagine the sector, if such a thing exists, could look if it were folding in some of these ideas in another 20 years? I mean, particularly you two, because it's your 20 years to get it right. We have time is passing, sorry. Um, <laughs> So, you know, do you, have, do you have a feeling for, you know, can you, can you project yourself 20 years forward and think about those kind of institutional and pricing questions? What would you like to see happening? Yeah, sure. So, um, I won't go into the specifics in terms of costs then. Um, in terms of uh, finance models, um, I don't believe, well, so in each independent nation will have their own government policy and the amount that they want to, um, the government also wants to plow in with how much money they want to plow into, into the sector. Um, and of course, they're constrained by their, their budgets. Um, so from knowing what I know regarding the political climate, I can only envisage a collaborative process between private enterprise, government uh, funding, and NGOs being able to muster the money up together as a collective part and distribute that into, into these communities. Um, I don't see it working any other way. Uh, I don't think that households will be able to finance uh, any of these solutions uh, individually because even if we talk about, if, I would even say even if uh, a unit was to cost $100 for a lot of these households in somewhere, even in Virginia, um, that's, you know, years worth of income. So if even though you say it may be expensive and it's worthwhile investment, if cash isn't there, cash isn't there, and therefore we need to seek ways to fund it alternative ways. So mm. that's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. Rosie, do you have a feeling for how, how the sorts of ideas that you're innovating in your programs, how they might be embedded into more sort of permanent scaled structures? You know, if it can't be you yourself doing the work. <laughs> Okay. What's your experience on I that? Know I'm past it. You're not. I didn't say that. <laughs> I said you and I are older than them. That's all I said. <laughs> um, I think actually it needs a change of thinking, and we we have to start encouraging, to give the description, developing countries, um, to realise that sanitation is an investment, mm -hmm. and and it is an investment. It's a long term investment, and they have to budget accordingly. So, you know, it's, regardless of different countries, you know, they'll spend huge amounts of money on um, building roads, mm -hmm. but they don't look at, the, at, at sanitation as having the, the same sort of impact that a road can have. Mm -hmm. And it can have an enormous amount. And I've just seen um, the Toilet War Co Coalition came out with a document on India, which, and uh, it's the, the hackneyed World Bank figure that for every one dollar invested in sanitation, it gives an output, and I think it's now down to something like four point three dollars. But um, it, it is that type of, um, I forgive the description as well, sales pitch mm. that we have to go in with and say, look, this will make a positive impact to your economy, mm. and I don't think we do it. Well. One yeah. of my big, real frustrations is that. We have different bodies who are there to, to sort of represent NGOs in varying formats. And none of them, in my opinion, are doing a good job because they're, 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 not, they're not representing the NGOs doing the work on the ground. They seem to be representing this very narrow band of, of, of <coughs> policies 
mm. when actually to be going out and saying, this is the real impact you can have on the, you know, yeah. by doing this. Yeah. I don't think it's being done well enough. No. I mean, it's no good an NGO doing it because they think we've got a, um, our own personal uh, yeah. page. I actually also have a, I've always had a thought that one of the big problems with sanitation is that it's one of, it's the, almost the only development sector where if you do it really well, it disappears. But like every other development intervention is visible, and sanitation is the only one where it's exactly the opposite. You can see the problem, but if the solu you know, the solution is really, you know, a perfect solution becomes almost invisible, and that is quite a difficult. It's a bit like clean air, which is another area that's extremely difficult to and disease control generally. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to pitch to John a moment because I know you're a sort of systems thinky sort of person, and I don't want to preempt your your talk after the break. So, I mean, how? How does that all sound to you? What does that make you think? I, I think we're in for a very rocky ride. Um, I think the, the projecting forward, uh, how many years, five years, 10 years, um, 20 years, the scale of the problem, particularly in the urban context, is so big. The potential solutions are so disruptive. The political um, consequences of doing anything by the politicians is so negative. Mm. that I think you're going to see very little by way of solution, whether it's possible or not. I think we'll see um, some initiatives that will emerge, which are from the bottom up. Charities, small enterprises, will we'll find a way of making a buck or two out of doing something. And I think if that can happen, then it will be a bit like a virus, it just spread. Because the poverty is so acute that if anyone can make a dollar or two, they will they will do it because that's the way they keep the, the kids alive. And and to me, the answer there will lie in very very small innovations, especially in the urban context, for the poor. For the rich will be a different story. They can pay somebody to come and do their job for them, and there'll be um, sort of different streams of solution depending on which community is being served. And I think the politicians will be largely um, uh, emasculated because of the problems of um, doing anything. That's my pitch. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> that, I think that's definitely something to, to bear in mind. I mean, again, and that's, that presents a big challenge because that almost certainly locks us into a lot of highly inefficient systems when we could, especially in urban areas, we need... Or if we were going for a sort of well-organised system, we would have some sort of spinal services which was in, initiating that. Back to you, lovely audience. How are you feeling? Optimistic or um, realistic? Pessimistic? Not quite sure where we're going there. Uh, does that? Any other thoughts? What do you want to talk about? Yes, <coughs> or another totally different point. Uh, no, the thing you mean, sorry, don't have much context. The presentation I had earlier uh, about containment-based sanitation yeah. uh, and the big table that went up on the uh, on, on the objective. <coughs> Which, which was shown the rental costs, basically, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. From $7 to 40 dollars I imagine, I mean, that, that that's the model you're looking at, some some form of rental model. Higher purchase or whatever, yeah. Well, I, think, I think they're service fees. That's, so that's what you pay to have somebody come and take it away. Yes, but no, but you pay to have access to the infrastructure as well. I mean, you're paying for the whole service. That's all you pay. You don't have to buy your initial unit. Yes, but that's what I'm getting at. Yes. Yes. If you are paying to have it empty. Yeah. And then add with everything else that goes And maintained, and mm. then you're, you're paying to have the unit. That's my understanding. Yeah. That's, yeah. But even at $7 a month, for, for the majority of people who live in urban areas, they're renting. Yeah. So, what, why, as, a, as a renter, are you going to invest in the sanitation? Mm. That's, that's a huge problem we face. Um, and another, another point to, uh, I think it's the EcoSan. Uh, San Eco, uh, sorry. The, you, you mentioned. Um, uh, supporting entrepreneurs that were, were in most need. Mm. You've got to support entrepreneurs that can make the most money, because that's where the, the financial sustainability of the businesses that they're doing rests. That's what that's where it is. And I think that's that's how we'll we'll bring about lower unit costs. Is initially by supporting business to get the spread, mm. not amongst the poorest market, but amongst those early adopters. Because mm. we know from history and, and the, the development of business that early adopters produce the, the unit costs. Mm. I think the other thing that's a very important idea in that is that, and it, there's a, an interesting thing I see happening, because we've got a lot of people moving from rural sanitation to urban sanitation, 
there's this idea of focusing on buying a piece of infrastructure. And if you think about the sewerage service that some people enjoy, you don't buy infrastructure, you subscribe to a service, like you subscribe to your water service. And I really do feel that that's something we've got to start thinking about, is irrespective of what piece of kit and what, what lies behind it, whether it's a truck or a pipe or whatever it is, I think it's much more likely that people who are, as you rightly say, predominantly renting accommodation are much more likely to be paying, be able to invest in a service rather than having to sink a load of their capital into infrastructure, which they may lose. Yeah, exactly, because it's not their house. Some nods and shakes over there. So, uh, lady with glasses and then the lady without glasses. There are, I mean, just those two, not the rest of you. <laughs> Uh, because in the three talks, there wasn't much about, it was more about the technology, but not anything about the behavior change aspects. And particularly for India, um, there are many, well, there's a huge upscale, obviously, of sanitation uh, building in India, but a lot of people don't necessarily use their sanitation um, their toilets, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about and also um, about ensuring that everyone in the household has uh, shit and that ends in the toilet. Um, yep. People with disabilities, other people, or even children, which is not how OK, I'll take the point behind, and then we can wrap up here. <laughs> My point was just, is there any value attached to the, buy the, to the pro products of, of converting the, the mm. feces and the urine? Because there are some benefits in, in producing Energy that they yeah. can actually yeah. produce some sort of power gases yeah. that yeah. be used for cooking or other things. I mean, is that, yeah. is that part of the equation? Perfect. So I'm just going to throw that back to you, but I actually did mean to say to you, sorry, I had to be very nerdy and professorial for a moment. When you were talking about value, you forgot phosphorus. You talked about energy, but not phosphorus, and phosphorus is a big point there. Okay, so I'm going to throw it back to the panel. Uh, you can just reflect any quick or sh you know, fairly concise responses to those points, and then I'm going to ask you a final wrapping up question. Did you want to jump in on these two points? Yeah, yeah. so just the first comment. Um, so currently, we're just in the African region at the moment. We are planning to go to different locations to get feedback on user acceptance and user uh, like adoption of these technologies. So India's in the pipeline. And we recognise that there are, um, like you said, we need to. If someone's not using it in the household, we need to learn what is that barrier. So that that is what we're doing the testing for at the moment to get that feedback. Um, on the second comment, um, so it, we can um, create pathogen-free water. It can be used for irrigation. Um, in theory, people could drink it, but we, from our ethnographic study, we know that people won't, they're, they're not going to. Um, in terms of um, the generation from the combustor, in terms of turning into ash, it turns into ash, it's not turning into any kind of combusting uh, material, so, uh, combusting material, so um, where, you, where there's that potential market opportunity with certain toilets, it's not being developed, that's not being developed with our toilet. However, what we're looking to do is there will be a surplus energy generation from the unit, and we're looking at how would we be able to store it, and then would they be able to use that electrical energy elsewhere in their household. So maybe not a marketable commodity, but something that would be useful for the household. OK. Uh, any other tech, sort of techie responses, specific responses to Can comments? I just yeah. Um, the answer is yes, you can take feces and other, other organic wastes, um, put them in a, in a bag and make gas, and then that gas is potentially, uh, and is, being widely used as the cooking fuel. Mm. And but what, it, what personally I find particularly critical is that I believe we're on the cusp of a crisis with timber. Mm. Um, 750,000 tonnes of trees per year are felled to, to just produce the charcoal that Dar es Salaam needs to cook with. Mm. And if all people can't cook, because they can't make charcoal, what they're going to eat. Um, and you can use that gas for cooking, and that's why we use the well, and that also picks up a point um, that was made earlier down here, which if you think about urban systems, you know, one of the most efficient ways of extracting energy is actually to, uh, to use anaerobic digestion 
with your organics from your solid streams with some of your sludges. So there's, there's also systemic, and it comes back to your point, if we could get cities to take really rational decisions or kind of progressive decisions, we could do a lot more than we will do if we have those little itty-bitty responses. Did you? Yeah, yeah. so if I can take the second question first. We sell um, compost. Um, we've given away vast amounts of compost. And from every farmer that we get, and farmers are conservative by their nature. You know, they are very cautious about something new. Um, in fact, I've just re re been in the process of rewriting a case study with a farmer who trialed rice on one acre of land. He didn't get greater quantity of rice produced, but everybody wanted to buy his rice. And he said that's the most important thing for him. He didn't have to go into a queue and just be one of another load of farmers selling rice. They all said, yours is really good rice. The rice was um, thicker. It was, it was just better all around. And that's a big, big confidence boost for, for farmers. So yes, we are doing that. Um, if I go to the first question, um, our village units, um, we have quite interesting. We, we've done um, a survey of about seven of our villages, which cover about 3,000 family. Three thousand pounds. <laughs> and actually, what we found is uh, the majority of women and girls um, use the toilets. Surprisingly, the majority of boys use the toilets. The men don't. But after each rainy season, the men use the toilets during the rainy season. Fewer of them go back into the fields afterwards. So it's a slow process. In urban areas, we have approximately 89% usage. We work hard on all of our communities. We don't just turn up, toilets go. We have a constant interaction with people. We help them form local committees. We put on peer pressure without it being over the top. And we think, you know, apart from the people who have never used toilets, we can get up to 95% within five years. Rosie, anything you want to add? Uh, just to any quick last thoughts? Um, I was going to say, yes, we use our fertilizer. Um, the, the liquid and solid fertilizer is actually still bad in the sun. And you still have all the months later, on early um, fish, fish farming ponds work very well and on crops. Um, back to the access point, we worked really close with another NGO. We found out that again, the men weren't using toilets. So we actually um, created a new rhino, which then went to go and then so it's coffee break I don't want to keep you too much longer but I think if you take something away from this it's that it's a set of building blocks right I mean yes you can have exciting new kit you can have exciting new sort of ways of thinking about engaging with the community you can have partially kit, partially implementation models and you can think about how that fits within legal structures and social norms which is super important uh, you've also all raised the question of how that fits into institutional structures, which really matters. And I think really, really important is to think about how that all fits within public finance, which is a much neglected topic. And since we're in a WASH and NTD conversation, I think that's where we can be very sophisticated and much cleverer than we've been before about looking at all the public finance flows that we could tap for these types of interventions. So primary health care, um, core health budgets, municipal budgets, um, property taxes, you know, there's a whole bunch of smart things. So perhaps next year we could have an NTD wash and public finance conference. How about that as a plan? Um, I'd like to thank our very illustrious panel, nervous or otherwise, because they've been absolutely fantastic. Uh, if I could invite you all to give them a round of applause.